Now, most African Americans coming out of slavery, obviously, were unskilled laborers or plantation laborers, field laborers, something like that. Most of them were not literate. There were some slaves who managed to get education in one way or another, steal education, as Frederick Douglass put it, or maybe in the army, get some basic education, or from the Freedmen's Bureau. But, you know, most slaves obviously were, had no access to education before the Civil War, that's clear. But the fact is, as we have seen, it is not the case that the four and a half million black population was a complete homogenous mass of ignorant people unprepared for freedom or political power. First of all, there were half a million free blacks before the Civil War, more of them in the South than in the North. We've seen that particularly in places like South Carolina and Louisiana, there were significant free black populations. And in those two states, these free blacks took the lead very rapidly in political organization and were, many of them were highly educated, property, totally qualified. There were smaller free black populations in many other places, Alabama, up in Virginia. So there, there were those. And then there were others. There were men who had served in the army would become significant political leaders very often. There were ministers, um, teachers, um, skilled artisans. The, in other words, what I'm trying to uh, talk about is how does leadership emerge out of a community like the former slaves? And it tends to be people who have a particular skill, a particular reputation almost for good judgment, even if they don't have much of an education. Uh, personal attributes that they are respected in their community. That's why soldiers always you kind of rise to the top. People respected for courage or honesty or moral correctness, concern for the well-being of the community. In other words, if you you know if you look at the I don't know New York State Legislature today. Well, don't let's forget about the New York State Legislature. <laughs> let's look at the New Jersey Legislature or some other place. I don't know where. There must be a good legislature somewhere. Um, what are the people in the legislature? They're lawyers. They're 90% of them are lawyers. That's the people in the legislature. And then occasionally there are others. There are people in various businesses, maybe a few doctors. But nowadays, almost all political office holders are lawyers of one kind or another. Um, not case, there were no black lawyers hardly before the Civil War, so that's not what you're going to do. And you're not going to get planters, you're not going to get rich people, so it's other kinds of people who come to the fore here. Um, and this is an image of some of them. Yeah, this is a, another witness, widely circulated, of the first black members of Congress. Over on the left is Hiram Revels, the first African-American senator, and all the rest are members of the 41st and 42nd Congress. These kinds of images are circulated, they're printed, they're you know, popular prints, they're circulated widely in Reconstruction America, particularly among the black population. Frederick Douglass made a very interesting comment about a portrait of Revels. Revels, the guy on the left, the first African-American senator. There was a painting done of him, and then it was reproduced as a lithograph all around the country. And Douglas said, you know, it's wonderful. This, we have seen from before the war, some of the, or even from the Civil War, the racist caricatures, which were so common in public culture at that time. Douglas said, it's wonderful to see a portrait of a black man who is not presented as a kind of ape or monkey or something. This is a person you can, you know, even if you don't, he's a respectable person. He's somebody you can look up to. You can show your children. There were very, very few images like that uh, before the Civil War, but now these kinds of things are, are uh, being widely circulated. Now, let, let me ask you to take a look at this sheet that was handed out. It's both, there's two sides. I'm not gonna go through every single thing on here, it's worth maybe discussing a little bit in the discussion sections, but this is something that I just compiled of black Reconstruction office holders. Just some random statistics, basically, and this is partial. I don't claim that these are accurate numbers. This is what we know, but there's a lot out there, as Rumsfeld said, right? The no, things we no, don't even know we don't know, or something like that. Um, I know that we don't know a lot of information because it's buried in local records and census records and tax records. But you can just, if you look at this, you'll just see some basic patterns. First of all, the 
number of African Americans who held office is pretty much proportional to the size of the black population in these states. So South Carolina, the, with the largest population, has the most, Mississippi. The outlier here is North Carolina. North Carolina only has about 25% black population, but has a lot of black office holders. And one of the reasons is they were one of the few states, and we'll see this in a minute, to develop a genuine interracial Republican Party with very significant white support, particularly from the poorer whites. We've talked about them in Western North Carolina. Uh, many of them had been hostile to the Civil War. And they were perfectly happy to have African Americans in local office in other areas. In other words, the black population of North Carolina is mostly concentrated in the east along the Atlantic coast. The white Republican population is in the west in the mountains. And so they kind of have a local, you know, local elections. It doesn't matter if uh, the, to the whites in the West if blacks are elected in the East. In fact, they kind of feel it serves the planters right, you know. So, um, so they, but in other, like Georgia with a large black population, the white Republicans were much more racist actually, so you have fewer. But anyway, that's one set of statistics. It's un, it really impossible to say how many were free and how many were slave because the census, the manuscript census, which lists people, does not tell you if a person had been free or slave before the Civil War. So you have to find that elsewhere. And I, my guess is most of the quote, unknown were actually slaves before the Civil War. If someone had been free, you can find that out. And so I, my feeling is that the ex-slaves are a much larger majority than these numbers might uh, might suggest both means people who were born slave and became free in some way, whether fugitive slaves or people who bought their freedom or something like that. Um, one of the more interesting statistics, and by the way, this is all, you know, I, I compiled all this before there was even something called the internet, before there was Wikipedia, before there was Ancestry.com. This was done through looking at the manuscript census returns, looking at microfilms forever, looking at other newspapers, documents. So it's incomplete. If you did this now, I'm sure you'd come up with more numbers. But the most interesting thing is this literacy. The image of the, old, of the black office holders was that they were totally ignorant, totally illiterate, but the vast majority were, in fact, literate. It says that in the census. They had managed to acquire education somehow. So that certainly is not correct in the old view. Then there's a list of all these different kinds of offices that were held. You can see a lot of them in state legislatures and other kinds of things. And then quickly, if you flip over to the other side, what I was talking about before, the kind of occupations that black officials occupied. There are some lawyers. There were some lawyers from the North End. During Reconstruction, law opened up a little bit to blacks in the South. The, now, you, you know, they didn't really have law schools then. You studied law with somebody, took an examination. Um, during Reconstruction, it was possible for a black person to gain admission to the bar. It wasn't possible before the Civil War. But the vast majority, the largest group here, perhaps not surprising, is farmer. Again, unfortunately, the, um, the, the census does not, in 1870, distinguish between people who own their own farms or rent their own farms. We're going to talk about that next time, so it's a little vague. Um, but then minister. A lot of them are ministers, which shouldn't be surprising. Um, and then you see these other, uh, uh, other kinds, a lot of artisans, craftsmen, blacksmith, carpenter, shoemaker, that's a few, grocers, storekeeper, these, they're not rich people, they're people of kind of lower middle class, you might almost say, but are uh, uh, of high standing in their community. Another mythology is that all of these officials were just dirt poor and, um, you know, just own nothing. That's why they passed all these taxes, because they didn't have to pay taxes. The, the subtext there is that it's not, it's not just that they were black, but they were poor. That's what made them bad, gov bad officials, that they didn't, only people with a lot of property really know how to govern. But the fact is, a lot of them did own properties. Again, this comes out of the census or some tax returns or things like that. Um, but, and $500 worth of property and up was a not insignificant amount back then. Um, so again, I'm just, this old mythology of uh, ignorant, you know, the lowest level of society is really, it's much more complicated. The sociology of these group, this group is, is quite 
uh, uh, complex and, and interesting, and there's plenty more one can do to analyze this. And then the final thing, what I call other information randomly, is just uh, some interesting things. A few of them were actually involved in the abolitionist movement before the Civil War. A not insignificant number, about 10% had actually lived in the, either were born in the North or had lived in the North. There is a group that has not been studied. Somebody, I would, should write a doctoral dissertation about this, what, what I would call black carpetbaggers. We know a lot about whites who came down to the South during the war, but there were also African American Northerners who came down to the South. This is the first time in American history that you had that kind of migration. Before that, all the movement was the other way, fugitive slaves or others moving from the South to the North. This is the first time more opportunity opened up in the North, uh, in the South, compared to the North. So you had significant numbers of people coming down to the South to be teachers, to be business people, to go into political office. Um, so a significant number had actually, as far as we know, all these are you know, not complete, but this is what we know. There probably were others. We don't even know they lived in the North. Another interesting statistic, and we'll talk about this next week, over 10% victim of violence threatened, driven from home, assaulted, or even murdered. Some couple of dozen were actually murdered in Reconstruction. But even being threatened, assaulted, your home burned down, this is, you, you were, it took a certain amount of courage to get involved in electoral politics. I don't think there's any, despite, no matter how outrageous our politics sometimes seems to be, I don't think there's any other group of office holders in American history, even in Texas, where 10% of them were actually victims of violence uh, during their time in office. So um, it, it's, it shows you something about the nature of uh, the political culture of that period. 22 actually had owned slaves before the Civil War. We mentioned this a long time ago. There were African-American slave owners, most of them people who owned members of their own family. It was more of a legal status than of economic status, so that so, uh, a free man would buy let's say, if his wife was a slave, could purchase her at some point, or their children, um, but still retained ownership because otherwise they have to leave the state. And if they don't want to leave the state, you can't free a slave without them leaving the state in many southern states. But then there were a few of these who actually were significant slave owners, planters. The um, uh, uh, treasurer, the state treasurer of Louisiana, Dubucle, Antoine Dubucle, owned over 100 slaves before the Civil War. So that was a, certainly a significant number. Um, 129 at least served in the Union Army or Navy, so that's a significant source of leadership, um, et cetera. So, uh, you know, this is just a little snapshot. There's plenty more to be said about it. Um, and um, it, does, it does show us something about where this new political leadership, something unprecedented in American history up to that point of black men actually exercising political power. And these are office holders. I'm not including newspaper editors or just political organizers who don't have a public office but are like local Republican Party leaders or uh, something like that.